All right, guys. Happy Father's Day. Hey, part of uh, Father's Day and families, as men, we start every service out front with prayer. We pray over our families, over the service, and over prayer requests. So, men, let's get up. Let's head outside. Let's set that example for our families. Ladies, if you've got prayer requests, grab one of the guys or raise your hand. Somebody will come. We'll get them from you. We'll take all this outside, and we'll go pray over everything.
Good morning, everybody. As y'all can tell, I've got a little frog in my throat this morning. So I'm not going to do a lot of singing. I'm going to just do a lot of playing and praising the Lord this morning. This uh, group that I've got up here with me, they, uh, they're they going to take over and, and do the worship service pretty much. I don't know what the deal is, but it, I tried to sing earlier and... <laughs> Nothing came out, so we thought we better change things out. We're going to start out this morning. If y'all would, stand with us and praise the Lord with us. Shake, shake your feet, clap your hands, whatever you want to do. We're going to start out with will the circle be unbroken. Did you say shake your feet? <laughs> okay, just making sure. <laughs> that wasn't what I was going to say, but that's the way it came out. There you go.
Amen. Had to get us worked up. All right. Now, as you can see, we recruited one of our kids again this Sunday. Clea is going to sing a song for us. We're not going to play with her. She's going to sing by herself. She says she feels more comfortable that way. Right? No? Okay. She's a little nervous this morning, but just uh, stand up and just praise with her. I, what's the name of the song you doing? Take Me Back. Take Me Back. Okay. All right. Here we go. There's a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running, I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back. To a preacher and a verse Where they see me at my worst To the love I had at first Oh, I want to go to church mm -hmm. Trying to walk on my own But I wound up lost Now I'm making my way To the foot of the cross not a trophy for the winners. It's a shelter for the sinners. And it's right where I belong. Take me back to the place that feels like home. To the people I can depend on. To the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse. Where they see me at my worst. To the love I had at first, oh, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. Oh, I want to go to church. Amen. Chance, you won't come up. Not after that. <laughs> I'm telling you. Man, good job, girl. Oh, thanks. You, you even had some of them old men out there in the hallway were in shock. They're like, who's that? Hey, guys, it is good to see y'all. I do want y'all to know there is one little girl. Where'd she go? Oh, she's on the run again? Okay. One little girl took it serious about shaking her foot. She was up here dancing and everything, okay? Y'all can take a little, little hint from that. She was having a good time worshiping the Lord, amen? That's what we're all supposed to do. Hey, I do want you to know, hey, be in prayer this week. We have got a lot of kids headed out to Wrangler Camp, and they're going to need prayer along with all of their camp leaders. we got a couple of uh, folks that are going with them. And then also, youth t-shirts are back here on either side of the sound booth. Uh, the youth are got some t-shirt designs they're pretty excited about. So you guys take a look at that. See if you uh, would like one of those shirts and help us uh, support those guys, okay? Now, a couple of things. We're doing most of our announcements on the screens before service, okay? But we have got a couple of things coming up this next weekend, all right? We have we got a women's safety awareness on Saturday, June 25th, starting at 1 o'clock. Uh, ladies, if, if you at any time in your life have felt like you needed a class on safety awareness, we would love for you to be here. This would be a great time to be here. Uh, we, we are a, we, we're all about our, our ladies being safe and understanding what it takes to be safe, okay? So we want you all to be here and have a good time in the Lord. If you can be here, come on up and have a good time. Now, also... Sunday, next Sunday after church. And I've told you guys, we're going to keep this kind of a close-knit group because this is about our South African community being able to come together and be able to speak in their own their home language, which is Afrikaan, and being able to, to, to share with each other. But we're going to have a South African bride, and we're going to share the gospel. We're going to bring all these guys in here together to just spend time together, to fellowship, do a little horseplay, tell jokes, whatever they want to do, and we're going to love on them when they do it and let Let's share about Jesus. That sound good to y'all? The nations are here. God has told us to reach the nations. They're all around the world, but they're also right here in our hometowns and our home states. Okay? 
So I'm going to ask you all to be praying about that. Pray about for the gospel to go forward and to reach them. So here's what I want to do. We don't normally do this, but there's no better time than to pray than right now, and that's any time in your life. So we're going to pray for Wrangler Camp, and we're going to pray for the South African Bri, and we're going to pray that we, uh, we're able to see some kids come to Christ and see some men who maybe never heard the gospel come to Christ as well. Okay? Here, let's pray together. Lord, I just want to come to you on behalf of Drover Cowboy Church. I want to ask you, Lord, that this coming week, that as we have all these things going on, we have our kids going to Wrangler Camp. We have 100 kids down there that are going to be able to, to ride horses, shoot bows, but they're going to be studying your word as well. I pray, Lord, that you would just start preparing their hearts to hear your word, that you would soften their hearts to understand and to have the wisdom to understand that your son Jesus died on the cross for their sins. Lord, may you just allow them to come to know you in ways that, Lord, just the innocence that maybe some of us have forgotten. That just an innocence that says, he is my father, and I know, I want to know and love Jesus. And may they just have that, that love, have that, that unbelievable, overwhelming force of the Holy Spirit just take over their lives this week. I pray, Lord, also for the South African bride that we've got coming up this next Sunday. Lord, there's, there's men in our communities who have went to church when they were at home in South Africa. They've been working their tails off here. And Lord, they, maybe they just need to know that, hey, they're in a place where there are people who love them, are willing to give up their church home for them to be able to get together, to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel loved. Lord, and I pray right now that you would start softening their hearts. If there's men that are going to show up here and ladies, we know there's wives that are coming as well. We pray, Lord, that you start working on their hearts. Give the, the folks that are going to be here, give them the, the ability to welcome people in ways we've never thought about. Give them the ability and the spirit to, to make people feel comfortable and at home and just be able to hang out and just be able to, to relax and, and to share stories about home and to share about their home country and what they're doing here. And uh, Lord, as we know, there, there may be some families, uh, brothers that haven't seen each other in a year get to be reunited. We pray, Lord, that you would just take over that whole situation, that whole event. May it be a good time of fellowship with food, a good time of fellowship with brothers and sisters, but it may it always be about you. May we make sure, Lord, that we share the gospel in a way that touches hearts and that you would prepare those hearts to hear it. And may lives be changed because of it. Lord, this is a, this is a beautiful church building you've given us, and I want to thank you for it. I pray also, Lord, that you always put on our hearts that it's your church building, not just ours. We are to use it for everything that you send to us for it to be used for. Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks. Hey, men, it is Father's Day. It isn't a day where we get to, we, we're going to talk about men today, but it isn't a day where you get to sit back and do nothing. This is a day where I think God has given us for we, us to challenge you as men and women of God to step up and be the spiritual leaders you've been called to be. So, man, I'm going to challenge you. Sing louder than everybody else in your family these last couple songs. Be the leaders that God has called you to be in worship, in study, here at church, and here at home as well. Y'all good with that? Let's step up to play. Let's worship the Lord. All right. Stand with us now. Uh, Whitney and Sonny is going to lead us on this next song. Y'all have heard it before. We had a request for it, and I think that's... When somebody requests a song, I think that's from God. So we're going to make sure we do it. And the name of this song is My Jesus.
rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't save. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 And let my Jesus change your life. Amen. All right. Zach's going to do this song for me because this is the one I tried this morning and <laughs> nothing would come out. So uh, when I put out a song list, I always try to pray about the song list and I ask God to give me songs that I think somebody in that, it may be somebody that's never been here before, is going to hear that certain song and that's what's going to turn them around. So I picked out this song this morning. We do it. We've done it before. It's called The Gospel Plow. Zach's going to do it for us this morning.
Amen. We're going to do one more song. We usually just do four, but this morning, um, I just felt led for us to do this song. Uh, everyone here knows it. If you would, just uh, sing loud. Sing with us. If you want to close your eyes and, and sing it, that's fine. But it's just such a touching song. Probably the Probably the song that brought me to Christ. I'll I'll be honest with you. It's a it's an old song. How great thou art.
Let's pray. God, we love you, and you are a great God, and we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for everything that you've given us, Lord. I uh, I ask now that you'll just open our hearts, God, to uh, to hear the message that you would have preached this morning. God, I pray that you'll be with Chance and that you'll, uh, you'll preach through him, God, that your word be spoken and that hearts be touched and lives be changed, God. Lord, uh, if it be your will and somebody does not know you in this building, God, I pray that today's the day that you bring them to you. God, I just uh, I thank you again for everything in my life, and I uh, I praise you for everything. We pray all these things, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, kids, you are dismissed. I'll go ahead and take off to class. Um. Y'all would, adults, don't forget that they're going to hold them in class till you come and get them, just so we don't have, uh, have to chase them all the way around the church too many times. Um, guys, y'all go ahead and open up your Bibles. If you're using a phone, it doesn't matter. It, if you've got a copy of God's Word with you, open up to Genesis 6 for me. Genesis 6. Hey, and while you're doing that, I'm going to share with you that, uh, hey, I do appreciate you guys. Uh, we've had a couple of Dales preached here a month or so ago. We've had Corey preach last weekend. Appreciate you supporting those guys. Uh, it's been a long year. I just want to share this with y'all. Between building buildings and house fires and everything else, uh, your pastor's needing just had been needing a little bit of a break. So I got a couple weekends I've taken off this summer just to kind of rebuild some family stuff and also just kind of relax and get my mind back on track. Okay, so uh, I appreciate y'all if y'all understand that. Uh, it's just it is what it is. Got a busy life. I, if you don't know, I run a I own a business. I uh, work full-time job and also pastor up here, so it gets to be a lot sometimes, okay? So uh, just bear with us, help us just to rejuvenate ourselves, and we'll get back, back on track. But Genesis 6, I'm going to tell you, I've been trying to, uh, praying about and thinking about for Father's Day. You know, it's one of the hardest things is, is as a pastor trying to figure out what God wants you to preach on certain holidays, okay? And, and certain days where we honor certain situations, whether it's Mother's Day, uh, Christmas, uh, Easter, Father's Day, but I, I will tell you, God has really laid on my heart over the past few months that there's been a lot of people and a lot of conversations that have said things to me that that it's been a little tough on me trying to figure out how to answer it. And and I'll and I'll be honest, it's things like people are saying, "I'm sc- I'm really scared of where we're headed." You talk about politics too long, that's what they'll say. I'm scared of where we're headed. You talk about overseas, and they're saying, I'm afraid of what our world's fixing to become, you know, with wars and everything else. Uh, people talk about school systems. One of the things they'll say is, man, I don't, our kids deal with so much more than what we dealt with when we were in school, or they deal with, with certain things that I never saw until I was an adult. Uh, they're, they're dealing with sex and drugs and things that were not part of the program of being raised, being raised as a kid, okay? And I always tell them, you know, here's one of the things, as a pastor, you go, hey, look, I understand that, but you've you got to have faith in the Lord. And by faith, that means you've got to trust him. That's what faith means. Faith equals trust, okay? And so you've got to have faith that God's going to take care of them when you're not there. You've got to have faith that when they're at school, that, they're gonna, that God's going to give them the wisdom they need, or they're going to turn and they're going to know that, hey, mom and dad are at home, and they taught me to do this, or they taught me to believe this, and they're going to stand on that foundation. And I tell them, that's what you've got to do. You've got to have faith in God, but you've also got to build a foundation for your kids. You've got to build it through God's Word. And you know, now you'll give them that spill. And here's the thing. Here's what normally happens when I talk to them about that. They shake their head, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, they'll say yeah. yeah, yeah. But in their eyes, you can see that they're, they're not confident in it. It's one of the... But the one of the hardest feelings for a pastor, okay, is when, when you tell somebody something and they'll shake their head, yeah, they'll agree with you, but in their eyes you can tell that it's just not there. The confidence in going, I, I just don't know. I don't know if God's going to be there the first time my daughter has pressure put on her. I don't know if my God's going to be there or my son's going to remember what I told him about drugs the first time that somebody produces drugs in front of them. I don't know if God's going to, you know, you can just see the lack of confidence. You can see their, their, their wheels turning and everything else. As a parent, have you all ever been there? Have you? Okay. I think we all have. We know the right words. We know what to say. We know what we're supposed to hear, what we're supposed to believe. But, man, there's just not confidence. And as a pastor, that, 
that's tough, okay? And so here for Father's Day, I want to help a little bit with that confidence. I want you guys to realize something, that we're not the first people to deal, to deal with a corrupt and a violent world, okay? I want to give you an actual biblical example, a real-life example of a father who led his family in a world that's just like ours, okay? And that's going to be Noah. I'm going to think you're going to see that there's a lot of things that relate to Noah's day to our day. So let's get into God's word right here. We're not the first fathers or mothers or anybody else to face a corrupt world. And, I, and right before we read this, we're going to be in uh, Genesis 6, verse 9 to start. I am going to talk directly to fathers a lot in this sermon. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're a single mother, you're in the same boat. This sermon applies to you. If you don't have kids right now, but you will in 10 years, you think God's going to bless you with kids one day, you need to hear this sermon as well because it's coming. Okay? So let's read this. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Verse 11, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth. 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. Set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. You shall come into the ark you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh. You shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, and of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you and keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Chapter 7. The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before man in this generation, before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, male and its mate, seven pairs of the birds in the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights. And every living thing that I have made, I will blot out from the face of the earth. And Noah did all the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Now. A lot of words in there. A lot of stuff going on. But here's what I want you to see. Right off the bat, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's get to know Noah just a little bit. I've told you before, when you read God's word, you got to take it, you got to break it down, you got to milk it for all it's worth, okay? Here's what he says. He said, Noah was a righteous man. When you think of righteous, here's what I think of. I think of a man who has morals, okay? A man who has a moral foundation that he lives on. Now, and that's what I mean. Righteous means that you have a virtuous, moral person, you have a man with character. Would you all agree with that? Amen? A righteous person has character and is virtuous. Now. Here's the other side of that. He says that he is blameless in his generation. 
So a blameless man, I want you to understand something, is not a man who is perfect. A man that is blameless means that he takes the information he has and he makes the best decision he can. Okay? So a person who says, they make a, make a great, they say to make a decision on where to go to church. He takes all the things in the, in the compass right there. He makes that decision. He says, man, they gotta, they're preaching the gospel. He said, I've been to a couple sermons. They're doing a good job. He says, man, they, they got a good worship. They're, they're singing God's the song, uh, uh, songs to God. We need to go to this church as a family. But when you get in there, you realize there's all kinds of corruption and things are wrong. Guess what? You are blameless in your decision because you made a decision based on the information you have, right? The same thing with God's word. You may leave that church in, but the same thing with God's word. When you have God's word and you're going through life and you're living life, let's say you're a new Christian and you don't know you're supposed to tithe, okay? But you start reading God's word and you say, hey, look, God says I'm supposed to give 10% of everything I make to God. Is it okay that you haven't done it up to then? Yes, because you didn't know. You're blameless in that decision. However, when you get that new information, what do you do? You change your life and you start doing what God tells you. That's a purpose person who is blameless, meaning that they take the best information they have and make a right decision. Okay? Here's what else he says. He says he's blameless in all his generations, and he says that he walks with God. Here's what Noah was. He's a man that had an intimate relationship with God. Think about this. You walk with God. That means you talk to God. You listen to God. You share with God. You look to God for direction in your life. That was who Noah was. Today, we would tell you that you need to, you want to talk to God, you need to pray. That's you talking to God. You want to listen to God, you study his word, and you do what he says in his word, and you listen to it about how you need to apply it to your life, and you make it happen, okay? You need to walk with God. You look to him for God's direction and everything in your life. That's how you walk with God. Noah was this man. He was also a father with three sons. A father with three sons. So here's the first question I got for you to help kind of get your, your mental juices rolling, okay? Are you righteous, blameless, and walking with God? Are you righteous? blameless, and walking with God. You say, well, why do you, why, why, why do you want to ask that question? You know we're not perfect. I'm not saying you are. I'm not saying Noah was perfect. But here's what happened. Noah dealt with the same kind of world we're dealing with today, and his family made it through it. Because what does it say next? Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Does that sound familiar? Let me ask you. When I say corrupt, and filled with violence, let's talk about it like this. Let's just start with the violence. What do you see on the news every day of the week? Violence, right? Any of y'all watch Memphis News lately? Okay. Just watch national news. Mass shooting after mass shooting. Let me, let me give you some statistics on this. The world we live in today is just like Noah's. In Chicago alone, there were 971 shootings in the first five months of the year. 971 shootings. There was more funerals than there were weddings. U.S. Today, so far this year, 21,570 murders, 126,430 rapes, 243,600 robberies, 927,505 assaults, mass shooting after mass shooting because we caught all the issue of crime and murder. What else do we, should we, I mean, you don't think we have a nation of violence, a world of violence? We condone killing the most innocent beings in the world, in our nation. We condone killing babies in the womb and as they come out of the womb. If we settle for that, if we lower the life, the, 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 the respect we have for life to that low, what do you expect our world to be like? If we won't respect life, at the most innocent part of our life, why should we respect it anywhere else? You think, maybe you think that, hey, look, I live in small town Arkansas. I'm not affected by this as much, okay? 
Jonesboro. Jonesboro, Arkansas. Right up there, right? Yeah, I'm pointing the right way. Average in violent crime is three points above the average in the U.S. Three percentage points above the average in the U.S. The average in property crime, that's theft, vandalism, and everything else. 24 points above the average in the U.S. This is Jonesboro. Jonesboro is only safer than 6% of U.S. cities per capita of people. You want to know what that means? If one is the, the most dangerous city to live in and 100 is the, mo- is the safest city in the U.S. to live in, Jonesboro is six. It's five above, most dangerous. So do you think violence and corruption isn't at home here with us? Now that's based all upon per capita, meaning for how many people live there. Here's what it really means. One out of every 121 people in the city of Jonesboro will be a victim of violent crime. One out of every 121. Talk about corruption. Show of hands, how many of you uh, trust your government? Show of hands, how many of you touch? Uh, how many of you trust the Disney Network on your TV? Everything's corrupted. Our churches are corrupted. Our government is corrupted. How many of you trust the educational system? I'm not talking about the teachers in Harrisburg. I'm talking about as a whole. Greed, personal interest, sexual sin is rampant in our governments, our communities, our churches, from the Southern Baptist Convention to the Catholic Church. Corruption is everywhere. Our world is exactly the same as Noah's. The crime may change, the lies may be different, but we are still violent and corrupted. So what do we do? See, God's got a warning. In Noah's time, in verse 13, he said, I will destroy them with the earth. Guess what? He said he's not going to do that again, but he is coming back, and we will be held accountable. We have a warning to us as well. Matthew 25, let me turn over there. 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, verse 31, right here. 31, 31, 31, got to find it. Here we go. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due and what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Guys, the warning is real. We have, our world will change. It will be turned upside down. Noah's time, it was the flood. And guess what? It wasn't a fairy tale. Listen to me when I say this. Christians have a story about the world flood. The Aztecs had a story about the world flood. Ancient Mesopotamia, Sumeria, China, everywhere. The Aborigines. Everywhere, the Buddhists, the Norse, the Native Americans, over 200 cultures in our world have a story in their history about the world being flooded. It was real. It happened. It is not a fake fairy tale. Guess what else is real? Jesus is coming back. He will separate the goats from the sheep, and he will say to the sheep, you are in my kingdom. To the goats, you will go to eternal fires of hell. The warning is real, folks. 
But he also gave Noah a plan. He's coming back, but we have to follow Noah's example. He said in verse 15, this is how you are to make it. He gave him instruction. Guess what Noah did? Verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. Chapter 7, verse 5, Noah did this. He did all that God had commanded him. See, Noah saves his family by doing exactly what God told him to do. Our world, exactly the same as Noah's, corrupt, violent. Our goal, to save our families. How we do it? We follow God's instruction. Simple as that. The warning is coming, has, has been made. He is coming. Jesus Christ will return. The question becomes, are you ready to save your family, Dad? Because guess what? The responsibility falls to you. Not holding any punches here. I'm going to be very, very honest. It is you, Dad, who will be held responsible for your family. Each one of them for their sins, yes, as individuals. But dad, you were given the responsibility to raise your family in the word of Christ and in the belief of Jesus Christ as the Savior. You can't blame your daddy. You can't blame your mama or nobody else. You can't blame what happened to you in the 12th grade or when you were 25. You are going to be held responsible. It is your job to raise your family the way that Noah did. See, Noah believed the warning. He acted like a crazy man to everybody else. He built a boat in the middle of nowhere. You want to know why? Because he believed God's warning. The question is, is do you believe Jesus when he said he's coming back? If you do, you better pick up God's plan. You better start reading it. You better start studying it. And you better start teaching it to your family. I mean, the question's simple as that. I'm, I'm not a guy who, like, gives a lot of if, ands, and buts. Okay? I wasn't allowed to have excuses when I was a kid. I don't expect grown men to have excuses. I had a coach who used a different phrase from this. He said, excuses are like dirty feet. Everybody's got them. They all stink. He said something else. Fathers, listen to me. Your job, God's command to you to save your family from what was coming in the eternal fires of hell is to take up his plan, which is his word, read it, study it, apply it to your life, and apply it to your family's life, and teach them how to follow it. If you don't want to sit there one day and watch your children burn in hell while you're in heaven, if you don't want to sit there one day and watch your whole family go with you down the chute, step up to the plate and do what God's called you to do. Study God's word. Share it with them. Teach it to them. Put them in positions to succeed. If you've got a baseball player, what do you do? You take him to practice, right? Some of y'all need to get up and take your kids to church. If you've got a kid who wants to run barrels or he wants to rope or he wants to do anything in rodeo, guess what you do? You go where they can succeed. You take them to people who know more than you. You help them rope. You get them outfitted. You get them set up the way they need to do it in order to win the rodeos, in order to be the best that they can be. Same thing with your family and God. Guess what? Baseball will go away. Your horses will die. You will get old and unable to ride. But guess what? Jesus is still coming back. Amen? That's what's going to happen. All of the things that you're taking your kids to, you think are the greatest things under the sun, will fade away. But Jesus coming back is truth and fact. It's not going to fade away. It's up to you to step up to the plate and teach your family how to follow God's word and have a foundation 
that gets them into heaven. You say, well, I can't save them. No, you can't. You can't help your kid hit the ball when he stands by the plate either, but you can help him get ready, right? You can't shoot the basketball for him from the free throw line, but you can take him up there to practice shooting time and time again, can't you? You can't run the barrel pattern for them, but you can take them and take their horse up there, and you can make them practice it 10, 15 times a day until they get it right, can't you? Well, then you need to be teaching your kids every chance you get to get them ready for Jesus coming back. It's all about priorities. And there will not be an excuse that works the day you sit in front of God's throne. You say, well, preacher, you're a little hard, ain't you? Chapter 7, verse 7. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark. You see anybody else going? You want your family to go? Or do you want them to sit on the ground hollering when the water comes? In this case, it's going to be fire. I want my family to go on the ark. I want to be a Noah dad. I want to be a Noah dad. You know what this also means? This means that you are going to have to make decisions that don't sit well with your family. Here's why. Chapter 8, verse 21 Saying, Genesis chapter 8, verse 21. Here's what God says. The intention of a man's heart is evil from his youth. The intention of a man's heart is evil from his youth. So you know what that means? That means you can't make decisions based off your kids' emotions. If you're a good parent, you're going to make your kids cry at some point. You say, well, that's terrible. It's truth. If you're a good father, you're going to make decisions they don't like. And if you want them to spend eternity in heaven, you're going to teach them this. Because their intentions from their youth, the intentions of a man's heart, are evil. Gospel truth. So here comes the question. Will you be a Noah dad? Will you be righteous? Will you make decisions that allow you to walk through life holding your head high because you know that you have character and you make decisions based upon God's word? Will you be blameless? Will you make decisions to change your life every time you figure out there's something God needs you to change in your life. Will you walk with God? Meaning, will you study His Word? Will you teach His Word? Will you pray? Will you listen? And will you seek Him for every decision you have to make? Do you care enough to be a Noah dad? Guys, we live in a corrupt and violent world. I'm a firm believer that's not going to change anywhere but at home. I think it's very, very important for us to understand that as violence and crime have risen in this country, so has the rate of fatherless homes. As crime goes up, they study it again. Fatherless homes go up. It's not a shot at mothers. I think there are mothers who are doing wonderful jobs and doing everything they can do. You know what? God never intended for homes to be single parents. You do the best with what you got. You got church family here that's going to help you if you're a single parent. You just got to ask. But God intended for there to be a man. And a woman, sadly I have to say this, people who were born a man and a woman to be parents in a household. And if we would see more of that, we would see less crime. 
and less violence. Maybe then people would appreciate having moral character, appreciate having values if their dads were there teaching it and showing them how to live it. A little somber, I know, but I'm very, I'm very convinced that we have been preaching from behind these pulpits, feel good, goody two-shoe gospel too long, and it's allowed our families to become soft and weak when it comes to God's word. So here's your question. Are you willing to change right now and be a Noah dad? See, blameless meant that when you have new information, it means that you make the decisions based on your new information. You may have made the wrong decision in the past, but today, today, I think I've given you the best example I can give you of how to avoid the punishment we all deserve as families, and that is to be Noah dads, to be righteous and blameless and walk with God. The question becomes, are you willing to do that? And it really comes down to the fact, do you believe that Jesus is going to return? I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to hurt feelings. I think it will. There's a lot of moms and dads in this room and around this country. I don't think they teach God's word to their kids. It could just be a little bit. A little bit at a time. They don't teach God's word to their kids because they don't really believe it in the first place. It takes effort. It takes effort. The question just becomes, is, well, are you willing to give the effort? See, Jesus Christ died for every one of us. I'm going to tell you something very simply. My parents are building a house in our place. Yesterday, there's a, there's a, there's a Mexican crew been doing the painting. They came in to do the painting. And uh, one of them asked me, he said, you got any vessels? Me and beer. I said, no, no, I ain't got none, buddy. He said, you don't drink? No, I don't drink. Why not? I'm a pastor of a church. you got to realize that this is all in Spanish. My Spanish is very horrible. Like I can get put in jail and not get out of jail. All right? I can do enough Spanish to understand and help me get there, but I'll never be able to get out. I had to think about it. I'm not one of those that's fluent. I had to think about it. And here's the simplest way I could put it. I told him, I said, because he told me this. He said, I'm very bad. He said, I know I'm bad. I said, well, here's what I'll tell you. Every one of us are bad. But Jesus is good. I said, and Jesus is good for every one of us that are bad. Simplest way I could put it, because honestly, I didn't know what else to say. I didn't have enough words to say what I wanted to say. But I've thought about it this morning, and I realized that's what it is. Every one of us are bad. Romans tells us that. We're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus is good. And he is good for every one of us that are bad. He was good enough that he was the perfect sacrifice. Don't worry, I didn't get to all this because I didn't know how to say it. But he was the perfect sacrifice on the cross for our sins. He took the punishment that every one of us deserved. So that you know what? So we could go to heaven, spend an eternity with God. So that we could lead our families to heaven. By being examples for them. So they can spend eternity with God. 
that through Jesus Christ. And the word tells us that if we believe in him, that if we are willing to believe in our heart in him and confess with our mouth that he is our Savior, we'll be saved. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that right now. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Where you're sitting right now, simplest way I can say this is that we're all bad. Don't think you're the exception. Don't think you stand out for how bad your sins are because it only takes one to separate you from God. The little or the big. But if you're sitting there right now and you're ready to turn your life around because maybe you've got some new knowledge today or over the last couple weeks and you finally come to the point where you realize that it's time for you to start walking and living with and for Jesus Christ. Start living a life for the God who died for you. I want to ask you if you would right now, just have that conversation with God. It's not complicated. It's not going to be something that's recited. It's got to be from the heart. I'll help you. I'll give you a little direction, but you've got to pray it from your heart. You've got to have that conversation with God from your heart. A conversation that says, God, I believe you sent your son Jesus down across from my sins. I believe that with all my heart, God. And I know I'm a sinner, and I want to ask you to forgive me of those sins, Lord. Help me, Lord, to have the strength to turn away from them and to live for you. God's word says that if you'll say that from your heart, he'll send you a helper for the rest of it. The old Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God will come and live inside of you. That Spirit will give you remembrance of His Word and understanding of His Word to help you every step of the way. I also think you sent us churches and church family to help us too. I want to ask you if you would right now, if you'll trust me. If you ask God to save your soul this morning, to forgive you of your sins. Will you trust me for just a second? Just look up at me and let me know. Because I want to take God's word and I want to show you what to do next. I want to help you get off on the right foot. Anybody? Don't let me miss you. Because I want to make sure we get a chance to sit down and talk. Folks, I'm going to tell you. As you sit there with your heads bowed, I think fathers are extremely important. I think mothers are extremely important. With your heads bowed right now, I want you to right now just to sit there and I want you to pray for your family. Or if there's a family God's put on your heart, I want you to pray for them. And here's why. Because God meant for every home to have a mother and a father because he knew the raising kids was tough. He knew it was overwhelming. And we need all the help we can get from our Father above to do it. And if you've got a family in mind, you've got a mother or a father who's raising kids on their own right now, why don't you start praying for them right now too? Because they're doing double the duty. And while you're praying for them, I want to ask you, if you would, would you, would you just ask God to show you what you can do to help them? If you know there's a single mama out there and she's struggling, ask God how you can step up and help her. If you know there's a single dad and he's doing his best to, to raise those kids, why don't you ask God right now how you can step up and help them? Or maybe you're sitting here and you are the one struggling. Why don't you ask God to lay you on somebody's heart so we can help you. Dads, it is your day. I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful for my dad. 
I pray you dads become knowing dads. Step up to the plate. Lead your family onto the ark. In our case, lead them to have a foundation for Christ. Zach, brother, you mind praying us out of here? Folks, I'll be in the lobby. If you need to talk or you need to pray, I'll be there. There's also going to be some elders down front. If you'd like to pray or have them pray over your family, come grab them by the hand. They'd love to do it.